time for at least 18 minutes of questions. And what I'd love to do, since we have so many questions out there to consolidate, that's why I pass out the cards. So when you're finished, just pass them back to the center. And I think one thing, just to prime the pump while I'm collecting and consolidating, that all of us are curious is, what do you think, given the vast knowledge that you have and have shared with us, are two or three pointers on how we can most effectively include national security messaging in our interactions with elected officials or local businesses, you name it, when we talk about climate change? Good question, and I, I would say I've learned from you while I was out here. I, you know, I'm 72 years old. I never stop learning. I hope I, if I die when I'm 90, I hope I'm still learning. Your elegant solution in terms of being civil, in terms of, for example, yesterday um, talking with Senator, Senator Cornyn's office and learning that his staffer in Washington would love for me to bring the Climate Security Working Group over and brief the staff and maybe even the member. Um, that's effective. That's really effective. And I also, and this is part of the same cloth, of course, but I also like what I heard about the way you want to approach the whole spectrum, the whole political spectrum, particularly the right, um, conservatives or whatever. Uh, that is absolutely essential. And now we, we're beginning to see cracks in their, in their edifice. We're beginning to see people actually thinking about climate change in my political party. We've had some all along. I've talked with a couple who have been with us all along, but they need space, they need cover. They can't be the only two in the Senate, for example, who might want to come and speak out and, 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 and try to get something done. So the more space you generate, the more people you generate who will be with them, maybe not publicly and officially, but at least behind the scenes while they try to create the space to become public, the better. Uh, I think that this is probably an example of the best effort I've seen by citizens to do just that. And I applaud you for it. Woo! He did from, not pay me to say yeah, that. Yeah, just a bottle of whiskey. Uh, uh, this is spoken from somebody that has toured the country, though, on your free weekends and given two days of every week as a, uh, almost as a tithe, if you will. And uh, Colonel Wilkerson travels the country, no cost to do just this. So that is high praise. I got I, I to tell you about Iowa. That was the last state. Iowa just fascinated me. 50% off the grid. And this is the agricultural state in the United States, not California, Iowa. By per, per capita output, Iowa beats them all. They bribed their farmers. <laughs> they went out and they said, hey, we got some money here. How about if we pay each one of you farmers $10,000 a month for a year to support a wind, uh, uh, a wind terminal is what they call them, but it's really a windmill with all the apparatus with it and everything, to include devices to keep birds away so they don't kill any birds. Um, how about if we do that? And the farmers went like, you know, when's the last time I had $120,000 guaranteed income for a year? Never. <laughs> and they did it. And they're now 50% off the grid. In four years, they're going to be 100% off, and they'll only have one coal-fired plant in the state, and it'll be moribund, kept that way, in case of an emergency. Every state can't do the same thing. Now, I realize Texas has got an entirely different problem, particularly with oil and gas being such a generator of revenue and so forth. But it is amazing to see what some of the states are doing. So there are so many questions here. We're going to bullet these out. If you can give uh, your best 40-second answers for each, we're, we're all ears here. Uh, so in a nutshell, how would you say the Department of Defense uh, interacts with Congress? Do they discuss climate issues, and what would the forum between those two be? And we'll just keep bulleting through these, so you can just give two sentence answers. Good luck. Basically, <laughs> the interface has been with the Armed Services Committee and the Appropriations Committees, as you might imagine, some with the Select Committees on Intelligence. It was almost negative. That is to say, anything defense said it was doing, they said stop. Of late, and of late is about the last 18 months, and I like to think we've had a little bit to do with that, and probably you too. Um, it's changed a bit. Now they're beginning to be able to talk about measures to adapt and ameliorate. 
And they began to talk about funding for that. And it's particularly true in the, in the disaster relief humanitarian assistance area because the Congress is beginning to realize that's a serious era. By, by the way, that's a very powerful public diplomacy tool also. When we do these sorts of things, Operation Sea Angel in Bangladesh, for example, uh, the Haiti operations of late, this is a major public diplomacy, and we need that kind of public diplomacy because torture and other things, and the Iraq war in general, has just about ruined our reputation in the world, and we need to restore that. Well, that's perfect uh, for the next question, and not perfect uh, in real life. Uh, what do you think of, this is a couple of people's uh, summaries here, what do you think of future U.S.-Russia relations in regards to uh, incoming Secretary of State Tillerson and energy management? Uh, and you can be bulleted, I know that that's kind yeah. of a... Um, <laughs> and you can pass, too. I, re I recommend uh, Rex Tillerson's speech to the State Department upon arrival. It's on the web. Uh, if he means that, if he's going to operate in accordance with those words to his some 6,000 employees at C Street and some 16,000 across the globe, uh, I'm for him. Uh, what that's going to mean with regard to U.S.-Russia policy and energy policy in general is more debatable. Um, I, we have reputable authorities within our group telling us that Russia is operating on band-aids right now and that Putin's biggest problem is not holding on to power because every time he pokes his fingers in our face, he gets another two percentage points in the polls. That's how badly we have dealt with the Soviet-Russian relationship post-Cold War. But He's got a real problem coming in terms of his number one economic tool, his oil. And I don't know how that's going to play out, but it could be a, a real opportunity. At the same time, it could be a disaster. So we need to watch that very carefully. All right. This, these are just so helpful, and I'm sorry that we don't have all the time in the world here. Uh, so, how do you think uh, a group like Citizens Climate Lobby can balance the influence of other groups that are advocating against solutions to climate change on the Hill? H how do you see that uh, those two working uh, kind of to be able to, uh, to balance, uh, rebalance the undue influence? I think what I've seen here, um, and I don't, I don't think anybody's telling me tales, I think what you're doing here, and, and what I saw in the Texas legislature, and as I said with Senator Cornyn's office, is the way to go. And I think it's changing. You know, I'm, I'm basically, all soldiers are cynics. You know? And I'm basically cynical about this. You're not, or at least your general attitude seems to be optimistic and not cynical. That's the best way to go about it, I think. I, I, I'll stay cynical because, I, you know, I hate Jim Inhofe. I, I do. I do. You know, I'm, I'm, Everyone's entitled to their own opinion. <laughs> and, 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 uh, Colonel Wilkerson does not speak for a citizen. Uh, all right, so next question. All right, so uh, what, uh, what is your thoughts with the change of administration? How will the military assess uh, its leadership with climate change threat? Is that going to affect anything? Will incoming Trump's appointments uh, uh, affect that uh, threat assessment? I think you're going to see uh, a real indicator with regard to the seriousness of this administration and national security policy. When Jim Mattis, the Secretary of Defense, and John Kelly, the Secretary of Homeland Security, leave. That's a moment when you all should check your six and see just where you are and what you think and what you might be able to do that would erode some of what might be coming down the pike. If Jim Mattis and John Kelly say that this president doesn't know where he's coming from and that the security policy coming out of the White House is disastrous, they will resign. That's the canary in the coal mine, if you will. If, on the other hand, they think they're getting their act together, and believe me right now, they do not have their act together. The National Security Decision Memorandum they just signed on fighting ISIS assigns public diplomacy to the Defense Department. It is statutorily a State Department requirement. John McCain has already let them know about that. <laughs> and it assigns going after their finances to the Defense Department, too. That's Flynn. That's Flynn who has neither the intellect, the character, or the temperament to be National Security Advisor. Look for him to be gone in six months. 
You, you can't do business this way. You simply can't. And if Trump is smart, and I think he is, he'll figure that out. And we'll see some changes, I hope. What are your thoughts on the rank and file uh, feeling of military personnel writ large? I know that you're an unofficial spokesperson here, but do you think that they have a general sense of uh, climate change uh, awareness in their situation? I think the officer corps does. I, I think it's a bit much to ask the enlisted ranks and maybe the lower ranks of the non-commissioned officer corps. They've got so many problems on their plate. Um, to, instinctually, maybe they do, they do have an attitude about it, and I think in most cases it's, hey, it's a danger and we've got to do something about it. The officer corps is very much uh, of, of a mind like the one I've just expressed to you, I hope. There are a few recalcitrants, of course, there always are. But basically, the officer corps, I think, voted for Donald Trump because they thought Donald Trump would do something about the stasis in Washington over not just climate change, but over so many other things. Tax reform, national security and alliance reform. There were those of us who were sitting out cheering when he was talking about making our allies bear more of the burden of their defense. That's something that's been necessary for 10 years, and every president has talked about it and done nothing about it. So, you know, the officer corps, I would guess, I haven't seen any polling, I don't even know if there is any that that's, simply looks at the officer corps, but I suspect from my conversations that at least 60% voted for Trump. And I think it was probably higher for the enlisted ranks. So they're looking for change. Your military has been at war for 16 years. Some of them have made three and four and five deployments. I've been out to Walter Reed National Medical Center and seen the women with no arms, the men with no legs and no arms, triple amputee in the Air Force is a good friend. This is not the way this country should be doing business in the national security field. One, we shouldn't be fighting some of these wars. Iraq comes immediately to mind. And second, we shouldn't be asking the people from the fifth quintile of intellect, education, and affluence to do all the sacrificing. We only have time for three more questions. I know I have about 20 here, so I'm trying to combine them. Uh, what would you say are next steps that we can take uh, with generally available resources to follow up on this intersection between climate change and national security? Are there any particulars you recommend, especially as we're engaging with policymakers or stakeholders? Well, I'm going to speak at this from a military perspective, a security perspective. The, the very first thing we need to do in the Defense Department is take care of this sea rise issue. It is on us. It is here. As one lady in Norfolk, when I was talking to a Norfolk audience about this, she stood up in the back of the room and she said, don't tell me about the future, the water's in my backyard right now. <laughs> and she's right. So for, for us in the military, this business of sea rise is huge. And it's not just domestic. Look at Bangladesh, for example. That's where we did Operation Sea Angel, where we plucked Bangladeshis out of trees. 15 hours in a treetop trying to survive. No food, no water, and the water washing around the bottom of the tree. We plucked them out with marine uh, amphibious vehicles, put them on the vehicle, and took them out to the ship and fed them and gave them medical care and so forth. And then when the waters receded, we ran them back in and they tried to restore their lives. We're looking at one third of Bangladesh disappearing. One third. We've talked to the Indians about it and guess what? The Indians, <laughs> you know, don't bring them over here. Uh, that's unkind. I mean, we've had some fairly diplomatic talks with them, but it's a problem, and it's not just domestic. Yeah. Uh, I think related to that, are there resources that we should read, books or articles or policy briefs that you think are most succinct or most impactful that we could bring with our next meeting, since we can't carry you along? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'd be more than happy to put you on the listserv for the Climate Security Working Group. Okay. Uh, you'd have access to all of our stuff, and we... We usually have the Woodrow Wilson Center, which you may be aware is now doing an extensive series on climate change. They've done water, they've done wind, they've done wind power, they've done solar, uh, they've done hydrogen, uh, just series after series. About every week 
at the Woodrow Wilson Center, they have a series of climatologists, meteorologists, and other scientists in general who come in and talk on one or other aspect of climate change. And that's a good source, that's too. A great resource. Yeah. CCL does have a national security action team, too. So if this is really resonating with you in the audience today, we, we really are looking to build that up especially. So Yeah, I'm more than happy to plug into any of those. I think those that things. we would love to connect with uh, uh, that leadership. Um, so the last question, and I think that this is personal in a good way. How do you deal with this? this knowledge that you have how do you personally cope with what gets you through your day you know you have a lot of information up there what keeps you going colonel i have a 14 year old granddaughter and i have a 15 year old granddaughter and a 16 year old grandson and a 10 year old grandson and i'm with them quite a bit the two in maryland almost every week the two that belong to my air force son every other month or so when we can get together. That's the reason I worry about this. You know, the Constitution says, and our posterity. We've forgotten about our posterity <laughs> in many respects. When you watch the greed on Wall Street, you watch some of the things we're doing in the world today, and you look at what we're doing to our reputation, to our real power in the world, look at what we're doing to a number of other factors that we labored for half a century to create. Yeah, it was enlightened self-interest, but that's what makes the world go around. When you look at that, I really worry about my grandchildren. And that's... I'm going to sneak one more in here, and that way we can get even one last round of applause, the biggest one you can muster. <laughs> but what's your thought? Colin Powell, is he going to run for office? <laughs> On April the 5th, he's 80. <laughs> I'm not far behind him. Um, one of the things, I'll just share this thought with you, one of the things that dismays me the most about my little tiny infinitesimal part of America's history is Colin Powell deserved a better president and he deserves now to be a little more, shall we say, concerned. If I detect anything that really disturbs me, and I've known him for a long time, it's that I think, and I'm speaking for him, and I hate to do that, but I will, I think he's more or less checked out. I think he's, I won't say given up, because he's still working every time he can with children, still working with Boys and Girls Clubs of America, still working with the Colin Powell Public Policy Institute at his old alma mater in New York, still working everywhere he can for the future, but I think he's pretty much given up on the Republican Party and on Washington, at least in terms of his being able to influence. And that's why we haven't probably heard more from him. And I, that's a loss. That's a terrible loss in my mind. Well, thank you. If anyone has any questions about why I'm clapping and talking, that's funny. Um, if anyone has questions about how to get a hold of Colonel Wilkerson um, after this, or you know, I know many questions where you know, hey, can we get you in Houston? You know, can you come to Nebraska? You name it, I'll I'll be happy to funnel those. So send them to me. Um, but on behalf of everyone here today, let us give you a huge round of applause. <laughs> Thank you.